Friends, our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 30, verses 15 through 20, and I will be reading to you from the message. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity, God is saying to Moses and the people. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today, by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you're crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him and holding fast to him, For that means life to you and length of days, so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. This text this morning is a powerful text. In it, there is the ultimate invitation to the human race, unique only to us which is to choose. The tree, the tree frog, the mighty oak and the slippery salamander, the coral reef and the snowy owl, any other of God's creatures do not have this massive power to choose. But we do. Add on to that the layers of access to resources and privilege, and some of us have even more power than others to choose. With that power comes, of course, great responsibility, or so the saying goes. Though I suspect that the responsibility that gets taken on is less a given and more another choice as well. So as I said earlier, this week we honor Earth Day, which is a bit of a misnomer, isn't it? Since every day, really, is an Earth Day, if you think about it. We don't live on Saturn or Mars. We live on the Earth, and so every day is an Earth day. That's all we get. Setting aside the one particular day to lift up the plight of the Earth might comfort our consciences, but as the ancients knew, that's not how it works. You see, we have the choice every day to honor the Earth and each other or not. God simply asks us to choose wisely. And the choice, profoundly stated in Deuteronomy, is between life and death, in the sense of living fully, abundantly, in prosperity, versus a life that is death-like, barren and dry and unfulfilling. It goes that if you follow the covenant in God's ways, then you will thrive If you reject God's ways, then you will suffer. But we know, don't we? It's not that simple. Good people suffer, and unscrupulous people thrive. And the choices we have, well, we're so easily tempted to do what is easiest for this moment and dwell in denial about what might come in the future. And yet, isn't there some truth there that we know from experience about the difference between choosing things that offer life and choosing things that seem to cause a death-like existence? When we choose wisely, we have love and friends and good things happen, or at least we have the eyes to see the good things, even amidst places of struggle and hardship. That's the reward of faith being able to see the good, having hope and possibility, no matter what their circumstances. And we know that when we don't choose so wisely, 
our choices come back on us, right? Of course, we don't, as Americans, we don't like our choices so clear-cut. Go down any aisle in the supermarket and you will see what Americans prefer. Choices beyond choices for every brand, flavor, and option there is. Have you ever gone down the bread aisle and just been like, I just want plain wheat bread, just that? And it takes you half an hour to find it on the shelf. But here in Deuteronomy, Moses says there's only two choices, life and death. Can't be. We won't, as Americans, stand for our choices being quite so curtailed. We would want to know, dear God, what our other options were, right? And not only that, but something inside us squirms at the thought that perhaps that God would be so attentive to our choices in the first place. I think there's a bit of us inside there that's like, God, just ignore that choice right there. Let me kind of go on my merry way. Again, probably comes back on us. Does on me. And besides that, how do you know your choice is the right one? Do you ever have that conundrum? Hmm. Life is complex. And yet there is throughout the Bible clues as to what inclination or bent God has in order to help us figure out whether or not our choices are good. You see, God desires for the community to be blessed. God desires life and wholeness, healing and justice for every creative thing. Martin Luther King recognized that not every good deed is rewarded nor every bad deed punished, and yet he was convicted about the truth that the moral arc of the universe bends toward justice. Have you heard that? King led us to this understanding that there is a leaning that God has in our choices. So right choices then bless the community, not just some, but all. Throughout Deuteronomy, the positive choices Moses is referring to are described. The right choice means canceling the debts of the poor, means pushing government to guard against excessive wealth, Right choice means limiting punishment to protect human dignity. It means paying employees fairly and leaving part of the harvest for those who need it. The right choice in the Bible means loving your neighbor and your enemy. The right choice meetings means feeding the hungry and housing the homeless. The right choice means reconciliation and forgiveness, kindness and compassion. The right choice honors all creation, all of it in nature and in each other. When Moses looked back, he discovered that life was best when the people were trying to please God, not themselves. And he finishes by saying this, so then, my friends, Love God with all your heart. Choose living by listening to God, and you will be blessed. Ignore God, and well, life is going to be a little less joyful, fulfilling, and whole, according to Moses. The thing is, we are faced with choices every day. And while the choice of a moment may seem insignificant, the choices of a lifetime tell the story of who we truly were and the kind of life that we led. Moses' sermon invites us to consider our choices and what sort of arc we are leaning toward to use King's image. That's a lot to think about, isn't it? What is the arc of your life? Well, when we consider the state of the earth this week as we honor Earth Day, and we consider the crises we are collectively facing. It's not just some, 
not just the poor or the wealthy. We're all collect facing these challenges collectively across the globe. These choices then are not only critical, but they say a lot about who we are, the faith that we claim, and the God that we serve. I think that we need to begin with a primal acknowledgement of the oneness of the earth and all its inhabitants, that we share this one grounded home, one atmosphere, one place in time, collectively. The pandemic, interestingly enough, has erased any lines that we may have drawn. And if we pay attention, shows us this simple fact that we live connected to every other creature and every other human being. If you didn't know it before, the pandemic has got to have pointed that out to you, that we do not live isolated in bubbles. The thing is, as people of faith, we know that this was done by design. We were created this way. Relationship and community, connection and interdependence were intended from the very beginning of creation when God formed it and us. But God also gave humans the ability to choose, to accept or reject, to heal and help or not, to choose to see this oneness and honor it and sustain it or not, to bless the connection we have with one another and with creation or damage the fabric of such relationship with self-serving interests, nationalism, and xenophobia. There is a story that I find very powerful when I think about these choices in my own life, in our community's life, and what it means to lean toward the way that I'd like to think God would hope I would live. And it comes out of the Native American tradition and it has been around for generations. And although the origin of the story is unknown, historians typically attribute it to the Cherokee or the Lenape people. And in this story, the chief explains to his grandson about human inner conflicts and choices. And he says this, he says, I have a fight going on in me, the old man said. It's taking place between two wolves. One is evil. He is anger and envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. The grandfather looked at the grandson and went on. The other wolf embodies positive things. He is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. Both wolves are fighting to the death. And the same fight is going on inside you and every other person too. The grandson took a moment to reflect on this. At last, he looked up at his grandfather and asked, which one will win? The old chief gave a simple reply. The one you feed. Choices. Every day. And how we react and act. And how we speak or remain silent. And how we heal or hurt each other and the very earth itself. We would do well to follow Moses and the ancient Cherokee chief, I think, and pay attention to the things we feed. Amen.